that level. That will turn on project for. Okay. And where we picked up last time, or left off last time, was we had just finished horizontal motion on land, and pretty much that was the what the uh, lab was about. However, that wasn't strictly horizontal. We were doing an inclined plane, but still the principles were the same. Um, 2.4 starts with falling objects. Okay, so that's where we're beginning today. Before we get started, any questions on anything we've done so far? I already had one question about the text. And they're supposed to be in. If you might check if we have a little break today to see if they have come in today. And if not, I'm guessing most of you are on cap. Huh? I, just I know, but in case you come in, you know, came in this morning, but they haven't gotten the boxes yet. So you might want to check because they were supposed to. When I talked with them, it was Monday, and he was supposed to have ordered them either Monday or Tuesday. So if it's second day, that should be today. Now they could come in tomorrow, but I'm guessing most of you are on campus tomorrow. Okay, so knock on wood, they better be here next week. Okay. Well, occurrences. I don't know how big a problem. Okay. Um, but while we're on sort of the what that's holding us up, and it is. Uh, you could be getting your papers done, okay? Yeah. Always a good option. Um, and then two, I haven't received the first lab one back in, though we had opportunities last time. If you got it ready, I'll take it anytime. Um, and uh, we'll, as soon as the books come in and y'all feel ready, we can go on and take test one. And then the second lab, a few people turned it in last time, but not everyone did, so... Uh, when you get those ready, I'll take those any time. Any other questions before we get going? All right. Motion. We talked about horizontal motion. Let's talk about... It. I had one more sort of dumb example of, you know, we were talking about forces, right? And... Uh, Nah, we'll wait. Hang off from that for a bit. Okay, so let's deal with falling objects. Okay? What would that be an illustration of? Say again? Okay, yeah, that would that would be what this thing is going to, your measurements you could take from this would be describing it. You know how they did this? Okay, one camera with the lens open, with the aperture open, in a perfectly black room, okay? But then they have a strobe light. So this is what it would be. This is one ball falling, okay? It's not a bunch of balls, it's one ball falling. Somehow they released it from here on some type of signal, and in the first strobe, it seems like it's a tenth of a second strobe or something about like that. On the first strobe, it was there, the next strobe was there, 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 and you see that every strobe, the ball is falling a little bit further, but the strobes are at regular intervals, so same time interval, what would that tell you about the velocity of the ball? Increasing, very good, which means the ball is, what you can say if you have an changing velocity, Accelerating. The ball is accelerating downward, and of course it is, because of the force of gravity. Okay. Uh, Galileo didn't have strobe lights and cameras back when he was doing his experiments. I'm sure he would have loved it. Okay. Here is the basic def uh, equation for the distance that a, an object is following. I say basic, this is not the most general equation. In fact, this is very specific. This requires that your initial displacement be zero. Okay? It can't be three feet above the floor or something like that. Initial displacement is zero. 
Also, your initial velocity is zero. And what does that mean? Initial velocity is zero? Yeah. And you release it from rest. You don't toss it, throw it up or down. The initial velocity is zero. It's released from rest. Okay? And then, this is an acceleration, and this is a time squared. Now, the units, do they make sense there? What would be your typical unit for acceleration? Yeah, meters per second squared, and you multiply it by second squared, you would get meters. Absolutely. Okay. So the units make sense. Now, the more generic and all-encompassing formula here would be something like this. Let me get my pen activated. D is equal to D0. That's if you had a displacement other than zero. Okay. D0 plus V0T, that's if you had an initial velocity, then that would be contributing to the distance that you went. And then you would have plus one half AT squared. Okay. Now, what's that? The O, is that what you said? Okay, initial or original. Distance to original. Okay. For, okay. Um, I don't know why, but what if your starting point had been, not your starting point, your zero from the measurement was here. So you had a, a meter stick down here. Then your initial position would be something other than zero. Okay? So that's what the D0 does for you, okay? Or even if the meter stick was here, and that was a negative distance here, that's what it would do for you. D0 is an original or initial velocity, and uh, so if you threw the ball down rather than letting it release from rest, it would have a larger contribution there before the acceleration kicks in. Or even if you threw the ball up in the air and it would have a velocity in this direction against the acceleration, okay? So that could be come into play as well. So if you had an initial displacement or an initial velocity, this is the more generic equation, the more general equation. This is only if the D0 is zero and the D0 is zero as well. Okay. All right. So what we mean by, okay, let's talk first about falling objects. When we say free fall, that implies a couple of things. Number one, they're falling under the influence of gravity alone, and you're assuming no air resistance. You know there's always, unless you're on the moon or in a vacuum somewhere, and you would be, not be able to live in a vacuum, you, uh, you always have some air resistance. But as long as your velocities are small enough, this air resistance is negligible. And most of the velocities where we operate, not say driving the car necessarily, but where we operate, the air resistance is negligible. Now, as you saw in the equation, the distance is proportional to the square of the time, not the time. The speed, though, increases linearly with time. The speed varies directly with time, the distance with time squared, and the trajectories exhibit up and down symmetries. Now that was something I meant to say before, and let's go back to this and show it. I think your assumption was, would have been that this ball is released from rest up here, right? If you had timed and uh, executed this perfectly well, this could have been one that the ball is shot up here, okay? Of course, you'd have to have it so it couldn't go any higher than that. That would be really tough to do, but the, the picture would look just the same. Whether the ball was moving up and slowing down or released from here and speeding up, it would look identically the same. That's what they mean by trajectories exhibit up and down symmetry. 
it would look the same going up or down. The acceleration is the same for all objects. Whether you throw the ball up, its acceleration is downward. Because you throw the ball up, as soon as it leaves your hand, it has a given speed, whatever speed you threw it with, right? What's that speed just a second later? Yeah, it's slowing down, so the acceleration is downward. If you throw the ball down, yeah, you give an initial velocity down, but then gravity takes over and pulls it down even faster, so it's still accelerating going down. So the acceleration is the same for all objects going up or down, and no matter the size of the object, as long as you're assuming no air resistance. Okay? We talked about that one last time. And there's that formula again. They like that formula, don't they? But again, remember that special for only when your initial displacement is zero and your initial velocity is zero. All right, here's sort of a your typical picture here uh, of releasing an object from rest. Again, you can't have thrown it downward or else this formula doesn't work. You can't have thrown it upward because that formula wouldn't work. Uh, so no throwing up either, okay. And you um, know you're assuming your initial displacement's up here, okay, is zero up here. You have to sort of set that. You can't have your, your zero displacement down here if you're releasing from up there. You have to have another term in there. All right, now. What this is saying, these numbers are telling you, your distance has fallen one half the acceleration times the time squared. In one second, oh, by the way, what acceleration are we talking about here? Releasing something from rest. Acceleration due to gravity. Anyone know what that is? There's two numbers we typically use depending on what units we are using. The first of these is 32 feet per second squared, if you're using the U.S. customary, or 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay? And if you think about that, that sort of makes sense because a meter is a little bit longer than a yard, so it's a little bit further than three feet, right? And if this falls almost 10 meters per second squared, that would be a little bit more than 30. 3 times 10 is 30 feet per second squared. 32, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so you release it from rest, initial velocity zero, and the first second that falls 4.9 meters, which is a little bit more than 5 yards. Okay? In the next second, it doesn't just double that because it's increasing its speed because it's accelerating downward at 9.8. Now what that means, meters per second squared, it's increasing its speed by 9.8 meters per second each second. So in the first second it's going 9.8 meters per second. Okay? The second second is going uh, it's increased that by another 9.8 meters per second, okay? So its speed is increasing as you go. So... When does it stop? What's that? When does it stop? Or does it keep going faster? Okay. If we're assuming no air resistance, it increases indefinitely. You know that's not going to happen on the surface of the Earth. Because the faster it goes, the more air resistance it meets, so then you can't assume no air resistance. But at slow speeds, and most of these are going to be pretty slow, uh, we'll assume no air resistance. But you know that it will always. So uh, on the surface of the Earth, it will always encounter some air resistance, and if it picks up enough speed, it will then reach what they call a terminal velocity we talked about last time, that velocity where the force due to acceleration downward due to gravity is equal to the air resistance force upward, and then it reaches the terminal velocity meaning stops, doesn't stop, but it stops increasing in its speed going down. Okay. 
and we talked about it last time too, in that, remember the wadded ball in the paper? The shape matters a big time on that. It's not just the mass, it's, it's the shape. But the fourth, the mass does come into play with that as well. So in one second, so we're getting in one here, one half times 9.8 times one squared would be one half of 9.8, which is 4.9 meters. After two seconds, is one half of 9.8 times two squared. So half of one 9.8 is still 4.9, multiply that by four, and you get 19.6. One half of 9.8, uh, three seconds, but again, that would be 4.9 times nine, 41.1 meters that fell in three seconds. And then uh, 4.9 times 4 squared, 16, 4.9 times 16 is on the order of, it's pretty close to 78.4 meters. It would have fallen in four seconds. Now, it doesn't keep increasing indefinitely because it's going to hit the ground at some point. Or, if it's high enough up there on its way down, it's Velocity increases so much, then it, the air resistance comes into play. What's that? Okay, if you released it from high enough, okay, I would say there's a pretty good chance it would burn up. The reason that um, meteoroids, meteorites, uh, burn, or meteors burn as they're entering the Earth's atmosphere, they have a large velocity to begin with, and then the gravity just increases that. So um, if you released it from rest, I imagine it would, okay, because it's so far up there that you have plenty of time for it to keep increasing in speed until it reaches that terminal velocity. Now if it was on a parachute, no, it probably wouldn't because that terminal velocity is so small because of the shape of the parachute that it's, it would never get fast enough for the friction of it to, to bring it to ignition. Okay. Good question. I hadn't thought of that before, but yeah, probably something there. Okay. Now, that was looking at distances. This one's looking at speeds. Now, your formula for speed, V final, and let's see, let's take this back where we got that from. Tell me again what acceleration is. Okay, that's the number. What is the definition for an acceleration? Change of, change of velocity for change of time. Delta V over delta T, right? Okay. The delta V we're going to call always, what's that delta mean? Change in or difference in of what? Yeah, V final minus V initial, okay? Over, and we'll just put the time as a time interval from, from beginning at zero, okay? If you multiply both sides of this equation by the T, that's where you get um, V final minus V initial is equal to AT. But if you're releasing from rest, what's your initial velocity? Zero. So that's where you get this formula here. V final is equal to acceleration times time. Okay? And this is why by that formula the velocity changes directly as the time, not by the time squared, that is distance, but by directly as the time, that is A times T, just so you double the time, you double the velocity. Back here, you double the time, you quadruple the distance, okay? Not doubling, quadrupling, because of the square, okay? Here, you double time, you double distance. Half the time, you have the distance, okay? So, not distance, velocity, okay? So in one second, it would have traveled 9.8 meters per, its velocity would be 9.8 meters per second. 
In two seconds, it would be 19.6 meters per second. Twice, two seconds times 9.8. Three seconds would be three times 9.8, just a little less than 30, that would be 29.4. Four seconds, just a little less than 40, 39.2. So sure enough, your velocity varies linearly with time because it's, it's proportional to your time. The constant proportionality is your acceleration. Okay. There is a little blurb there, falling bodies, and we've basically done that, or something pretty close to that. Um, now, all right, here's Ryan. I knew you would be coming back sometime, your stuff was here. Okay. Um, they have a little five-step uh, way for coming up with how they came up with that equation that we had before, one-half at squared. Let me put it this way. This is a good rendition of it. In reality, that's not how you got it, really. In reality, you integrate, okay, which we don't have the math yet for, so we're not doing that. And every time you do, you have an integration constant. So if you go back, remember the formula that I gave you before for distance, d is equal to d0 plus v0t plus one-half at squared. Just a little note here, okay? And I don't know if you realize it, but your time here is to the zeroth power, so we're not worrying about it, it's just a constant. Time to the first power, the coefficient that goes in front here is a one. Time to the second power, the coefficient that goes in front here is a one over two. So, and if you had a third term, the odds are, it wouldn't have to be, but the odds are, it would be preceded by or one over three or something that's derivative by three. Their little five-step program here explains that one half sort of as an average, which is a perfectly good way to talk about it, but it's not really how it comes about. Okay, it's a good way to think about it, I'll put it that way. But it really doesn't come from that, it comes from an integration constant. So that's for the one half. And I think as you'll continue in the course, you'll see that just about all of your equations where your variable is squared, you'll have a, a coefficient of one half. And in a few of the places, you might see a variable cubed. And most of the time, the coefficient will either be a one third or it'll have a three as a factor there. Okay? Um, so that's really it comes from calculus but we have you're not required to have calculus here so the best way the book can describe it is by the average and that's where you're dividing by two so i'll leave that alone it's not really worth going over to uh to try to to rationalize that because it really is an integration constant now there's also another blurb on uh, page 37 or thereabouts. I know y'all don't have your books yet. And this is talking about a closer look. <clears throat> have y'all ever watched the Tour de France or any of those bike races? Okay. They usually race in teams. But you know, guess what? NASCAR does the same thing, don't they? Most of the time you have teams of cars there. Uh, I guess occasionally you could have just a single driver racing for himself, but most of the time they're in teams. And what do the teams do for each other? Well, they may try to... They do what? Help each other. How? Well, they don't have cars. If they're friends, they need something like a wreck. They have a bar part or they'll have food or help them out. Get so if they, the impact window is down on somebody down here 
Okay. Okay, for sure. Yeah, in in the pits and stuff like that, it's really good to have that. In the race itself. Oh, they can draft each other. Ah, what do you mean by that? Well, it's pretty much where you line up like this right here. Reduce the air air. That's it. What you're trying to do, and the same thing, you watch it in the Tour de France. Usually, the winner doesn't always lead. Horse racing is just about the same way. Just about anything. In fact, if you watch track and field. Now, for the sprints, no, you go as fast as you can, try to get there, jump out ahead, and stuff like this. But for the long races, you don't want to lead. I can only remember one horse, and I'm sure there may have been others, that just jumped out in front and never quit. That was Secretariat. Y'all wouldn't remember that. Okay. It, he was just an incredible horse. I mean, he could just take off and run. And, no one else could keep up with him, so he did. But a lot of times, they let someone else lead to begin with, and then they come around. If you watch most of the milers and the, um, I don't know about marathoners. I don't usually watch marathons. They're pretty dull to watch for five hours, four hours. I, I, I've got better things to do. Than that. Yeah, I think they still do. Yes, exactly. And usually you have someone, and they actually call it the, the pace setter. And after a while, the pace setter wears out, okay? Because he's taking, or she's taking all the air resistance. You ever watched geese fly? You know, they... Yeah, in the V-shape. Why did they do that? Okay. It's, it's, aerodynamics. it's aerodynamics. They are drafting on each other. Somebody has to be leader. And as they say about um, in sled, and by the way, someone won the Iditarod just a couple of days ago at the big dog oh, sled race. race. What's that? And that's the Husky race? Yeah. Yeah. As they say there, unless you're leading, your view never changes. But never mind. We're not talking about that here. Okay. Uh, but. The, uh, when those geese are flying, that lead goose every now and then will peel back and come in the back and everybody moves up one. And they do that because that lead goose is taking in all of the blunt of the air resistance, the others are drafting on him or her, okay, as it goes. So yeah, that happens all over the place. That's what the closer look here of the bicycle racer's edge. Uh, Usually whoever jumps out in front to begin with is basically going to set the pace for a while and usually is not going to be the one who ultimately wins the race. Neither here nor there. But let's do example 2.7. I need a slide with a little bit more. There we go. We'll use this one. A bit more space on. Oops. Sorry, that's not what I meant to do. Okay. Now. Example 2.7, a rock that is dropped into a well. When you see the word dropped, what does that come to mind? Yes, the initial velocity is zero. Uh -huh. I like to use I rather than O. Sometimes the book uses O. I don't. So initial velocity is zero. A rock that is dropped into a well hits the water in three seconds. So three seconds a measure of time or your delta t. That's your 3.0 seconds. Okay. Ignoring air resistance, how far is it to the water? Oh, okay. Okay, okay. Okay. Um, how far is it to the water? What are we looking for? Distance. Okay, can we come up with an answer from here? Okay, do we know velocity? Okay, it started at zero, but... Ah, okay. Yeah, when, it, when the velocity was zero, you were traveling zero distance. But what was the formula we flashed on the screen at least twice? 
<laughs> That's it. Oh, yeah, I remember it, yeah. One half a t squared. And what's your a there? No, that's not velocity. And what acceleration do we use here? Yeah, if we were dealing in... Uh, so let's do it in 32. So that would be 1 half 32 feet per second squared times 3.0 seconds squared, t squared, okay? And this would be 1 half of 32 is 16, that's still feet per second squared, times, and what, 3 squared? 9, okay, and we can put a 9.0 if you want to, but you not don't just square the number, you square the units as well, second squared. Second squareds go out, 9 times 16, yeah? yeah. Isn't that around 44? Yeah, 144. I mean, oh, the second digit is 144 feet. Okay? Now, if we're using SI units, then you would use 9.8 meters per second squared. Yeah, well, you know how far a yard is, a meter is just a little bit further than that. So, yeah, you can do it. Okay, that would have been a half of 9.8 is 4.9 times 9.0 seconds squared. And that would, and this is meters per second squared. Second squares go out and you get meters. And 9 times 4.9, that would be 81. Um, 36 and 8 is 44. Okay, 44.1, but because we only have two digits of precision, we'll round that to 44 meters. Okay, 144 feet, 44 meters. And remember, this is about a factor of 3, a little bit further than 3, and sure enough, that makes sense. How far is that anyway? 44 meters down? About 144 feet. Very good. And how far does that say in terms of things you know? That would be about, about no, a little more, about more like 45 to even close to 50 yards. So that would be half. 48 yards? Yeah, that's a good guess. So I'd say between 45 and 50 yards. That's half a football field down. That's how deep the well was. It's not quite six. It's about three. Yeah, yeah, about three. A little over three. three. Yeah. So that's why the, in the book they left it as forty-four meters. Okay. Now, the way you are trying to do it with velocities, what you have to do is come up with an average velocity, and you are correct to say the velocity is increasing, but we don't know how much it is it is at any time, so you would have to do average velocity. Well, the average velocity was to be the average of zero when you first dropped it to three seconds later. Well, we know what the velocity would be there because velocity is equal to, I mean, yeah, velocity, speed, final speed, is equal to acceleration times time. So 9.8 or 32 times three would be what? Yeah, either 9.8 times 3 or 32 times 3. 96, yeah. 9.8 times 3 would be 24, 29.4, right? Okay. Now, that would be the final. The average would be half of each of those. So this would be a one, 4.7, and half of that would be 48, okay? So that would be your average speed either in meters per second or feet per second, okay? And then 
multiply that by the time, three seconds. And hopefully you get the same thing. Three times three. Huh? What'd you say? You said hopefully you get the same thing? Yeah. Uh, three times this would be 144. And three times this would be 44.1. We round it to 44. Actually, we shouldn't carry three digits there, but it's easy to do. So, so frankly, the one half AD, AT squared is a lot easier to remember than having to calculate the final velocity, average that final velocity with the other, get average velocity, then multiply by time. Yeah, you can do it that way, but it's a bit more work, and I'm too lazy for that. Okay. I like the way you think. All right. That weird, huh? Okay. So that's described in solution two here. All right, any questions on falling objects? There's that formula, one half AD, AT squared. Sort of hard to see under all the writing. Okay. All right, now we move to 2.5, which is compound motion. Not just horizontal motion, and not just vertical motion, but compound motion, which includes both kinds. Today's lab is dealing with compound motion. Three types of motion, vertical motion, we just talked about, horizontal motion we talked about last time, and the third type is a combination of vertical and horizontal, which is what we're talking about here. Sometimes we call this projectile motion, as opposed to vomit. No, we won't go. Okay, projectile motion, I was in the Navy, I was a gunnery officer, we talked about projectile motion, so yeah, it's, no matter, and weapons, whatever, you don't aim right at something, you have to adjust because guess what, wherever you shoot the ball, the bullet, the, the missile, whatever it is, is going to be acting under the influence of gravity, it will be falling. Okay? So projectile motion, an object is thrown into the air, not just straight up, but at some angle, some angle up, what, or even if it's thrown horizontally, it's still going to be affected by gravity. Here's your basic observation there. Gravity is acting all the time. It's never not acting. Okay? You shoot it straight up, you shoot it horizontally, gravity is always pulling it down. The acceleration G is independent of the object's motion. Whether you throw it up, horizontally, or any angle in between, the acceleration due to gravity is always pointing to the center of the Earth, which is straight down, and it's always the same magnitude, 9.8 meters per second squared, 32 feet per second squared. Now, the only really minor exception for that is if you leave the Earth's atmosphere, the acceleration due to gravity falls off, okay? We'll talk a little bit about that later, but we don't usually leave the Earth's atmosphere, okay? We don't. If you're going uh, to be an astronaut, yes, you would, but the rest of us stay close enough to the surface of the Earth that that is basically constant. From the bottom of the Dead Sea Valley to the top of Mount Everest, 9.8 don't work anywhere within those ranges. Okay. So, some other observations about projectile motion. You have two extremes, straight up or straight horizontal. Let's look at the vertical projectile first, what we were talking about before. If you were to throw it straight up in the air, it's slowing down as it goes up. Right? Someone said that earlier. As soon as you, it leaves your hand and you're no longer exerting any force on it, it begins slowing down. You gave it initial velocity, it's going to start slowing down from then on. At some place, it keeps slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, until finally it stops. And then after that, it starts speeding up, coming down. At the same rate, it was slowing down going up, okay? Stops at the top and accelerates down, okay? The force due to gravity is acting the same throughout that. 
whether it's at its maximum speed, at its minimum speed, or anywhere in between. Whether it's going up, or going down, the force due to gravity is the same. Now there is a sort of sicko ramification of this. I don't know if you've seen, hopefully you haven't participated in this, some type of celebration where people go out shooting guns into the air. Okay? What's that? Okay, that was exactly what I was going to say. If you were able to shoot exactly straight up into the air, exactly straight up, no deviation at all, then that bullet is going to leave the barrel of the gun, whatever you got, what would be about its speed? Does anyone know? Muzzle velocity? Very fast, okay? And then the first second, it's going to slow by 32 feet per second or 9.8 meters per second. The velocity is going to decrease at that. So let's say it's going uh, 900 meters per second. I don't know if that's reasonable. When it leaves the barrel, then one second later it's going 890.2. Right? You know, so it's slowing down very gradually okay, as it goes up. And at some point it stops. And at that point it stops, then it starts coming back down picking up at 9.8 meters per second every second. What's its speed when it comes back? That is the same as it did when it left the barrel. So if you did fire it straight up, move. Okay? And you better hope you move in the right direction. Okay? Uh, because it's coming right back down about the same speed as if you would just aimed it and shot it. So. It high. You don't want that to happen. Now, of course, there's some air resistance, so it will slow down a little bit, but not enough to write home about, and you wouldn't be able to write home about. Okay. But even if you fire it up in an angle, okay, guess what? It's coming down somewhere at the same, pretty close to the same muzzle velocity. Now, this actually happened. It was within the first year that we moved to Birmingham because it was somewhere on I-20 between here and the state line, one side or another of Aniston, I, I'm guessing. Um, a couple were in a pickup truck with a club cab, and their baby was in the jump seat in the back seat. Oh, man, it was so sad to hear. They were coming along, they heard something, but they couldn't tell what it was. They thought it was a car backfiring or something like that. They kept on going, they sort of glanced back, the kid was asleep, looked like it was asleep. Uh, they came on when they stopped for gas or whatever, went to get the kid and whatever, where they couldn't see it from there, a bullet had gone through the back windshield and hit because someone was probably target practicing or maybe shooting birds or something, probably miles away, probably not even inside of the interstate. And it just happened to be the bullet came up and came back down and just bad, 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 bad luck went right through that windshield. Not intentional or anything else, but still a dead child, you know, so it was pretty sad, okay? So it slows up going, slows going up, but accelerates back downward. So when it comes back down, it's going the same speed pretty much close to it what it was in muzzle velocity, okay? Now, horizontal projectors. You fire it perfectly horizontal. Is it going to stay that? No. As it moves, gravity is pulling it through the earth. Now, all this, we're ignoring air resistance on both of these, okay? That's why we say it's the same speed coming back. It would be a little bit less. But, Yeah. It's, that helps reduce air resistance. The, the spinning is kind of like a baseball, too, you know, except baseball isn't nearly as aerodynamic as a bullet. And the shape of the bullet and the fact that it does have it spinning, it sort of sheds the air rather than just hitting it straight on. You know, it, 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 
it worms its way through the air. Oh yeah, absolutely. Gravity's going to act on that. Probably go a little. Yeah, I mean the same kind of principle. A rifle shoots a lot further than a shotgun because a shotgun just blows it out there, but the rifle, you know, has that spinning and it's much more aerodynamic. But even if you fire it, or these quarterbacks that try to throw the football, what do they call it, clothesline, you know, right at the receiver, the receiver's almost always having to duck down and get it. They always have to put a little bit of arc on it because it's going to be going downward, you know, uh, as it, it's always following the curved path. Okay? Sort of why the pitcher's mound is raised. It's a mound there. So you can throw just about horizontally, always it's going to be uh, traveling the downward path. Okay? So, this is the one I think you mentioned earlier. You can do it with bullets, but they're far hard to trace those. But you can do it with arrows too. If the gal here is shooting perfectly horizontally, and the moment, the very moment she releases that, the guy who's holding the arrow drops it. Those two arrows will hit the ground at the same time. Certainly hers will go much further, but they'll hit the ground at the same time. Because the only thing that's pulling the arrow down is gravity. Okay? Doesn't matter if she shot it this way. All that does is give an initial velocity in this direction. That horizontal component of velocity doesn't change. But the vertical component does because gravity is increasing that on its way down. Here, vertical component is increasing on its way down, following the same, not the same path, but they'll hit at the same time. Okay. Strange but true. Okay. Vertical motions occur in parallel. The arrow has an, the arrow that she shot has a horizontal component. That doesn't change. Gravity doesn't do that. Forces perpendicular to the motion don't change the motion, they just change its path. They don't reduce the horizontal component at all. Okay? She has no horizontal component. It's zero. So its only component is downward. So it's the same force due to gravity that bullet has, that arrow has. So they strike, they strike the ground at the same time. Okay. Now, here's another, and this is a very hard thing to do, but if you were shooting at a target, that was up high, even if it's level, but up high, you always aim a little above because the bullet always is going to have a little bit of a downward trend because of gravity. Now, how these snipers do it, they have to be very good. Say again? Okay. That's what they do. They use the scope and they adjust that for their range. If they're shooting relative short range, you almost set the scope right where you want it. A little above, but not much. But if it's a longer and longer range, they set the scope higher and higher so that when they have it in the crosshair, it's really... Then you got to account for wind and all sorts of... That's why I said it. Those guys are really good. Uh, really, really good. Now, I didn't see... What was that movie? Second? Okay, one more time. American Sniper? Yeah, that was it. Yeah, I didn't see it, but... Shooter. Yeah. shooter? Okay. Usually when one is successful, they'll have a few of them like it. So, yeah. Um, yeah. There was a James Reacher, I mean, a Jack Reacher novel on the sniper. Yeah. That was pretty interesting. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So, you're a Reacher fan, too, huh? Okay. Uh, yeah, you have a little bit of that too. Uh, my father-in-law absolutely hates that they cast Tom Cruise 
for Jack Reacher. You couldn't get much worse than that. I mean, he's a good actor and all that, but he's a shrimp, you know, and Jack Reacher is six, seven, or eight, something like that, and big, big, yeah. So yeah, the really poor job of, and I think every movie so far has been crude, hasn't it? Yeah. There haven't been that many, but yeah, not good. Okay. Yeah. Now that one, he can do. Okay, that's fine. All right, passing a football. Okay. Once the football leaves your hand, or throwing a baseball, or anything else, once the football or the ball leaves your hand, or leaves the bat, or leaves the, the racket, or whatever you're hitting it with, or throwing it with, the, once it leaves, the only force acting on it is the force of your gravity. Okay? And that's always down. The vertical velocity is always, if you have initial velocity up, that component up starts decreasing the moment it leaves. At some point it reaches the max and then it starts increasing, going down, always in the same direction, downward, uh, once it passes the top. And the horizontal motion is uniform. No matter where you shoot here, whatever the component of velocity in the horizontal, it's the same all along the path. Okay? Everywhere the horizontal stays the same. I got. Fastest it'll ever have, right? As long as the alley isn't tilting down the hill, which it better not be. Okay, yeah, that's the maximum velocity. And because they have that floor just as slick as they can have it, and the ball is just as round, I think, as they can make it, uh, it's not going to lose a lot. But you hear it, so you know there's some friction. Okay? Um, so, yeah. But if that's the maximum velocity you have. We'll talk about that more when we get to the energy chapter, too. That's an excellent example of that. Now, the combination of these two, a constant vertical acceleration down and a constant horizontal speed, that produces a motion called parabola. Every shot you take with whatever you're shooting with, basketball, hitting a golf ball, hitting a tennis ball, they're all following parabolic paths. Now, for very short distance, you don't notice that. Okay? Don't notice it at all. But you are following. Yeah. Okay, now that's something different. Because if there is a rocket out the back of it, then it's always accelerating at least until it runs out of fuel. And when it runs out of fuel, then it follows the parabolic path. Yeah. That's a different story because there is a force from the, the rocket. Okay. But once a ball that has no means of propelling itself, no, that's going to follow parabolic path. Always. Pardon me? Yeah, all right, exactly. You would, yeah, it would have an acceleration until it runs out of the fuel and then it's, then it's parabolic path out of the way. Yeah. Just, I mean, same thing here. The ball's not in a parabolic path as long as he's pretty, you know, throwing it. But it's second leaves his hand, then it's parabolic path. Now, same thing you said about bullets, though, the spin. Those quarterbacks can throw those nice tight spirals, that ball will travel further because if the ball is wobbling or turning over, the air resistance is much worse on that. Um, there was a quarterback for the Redskins, probably well before y'all were born. Followed Sonny Jurgensen. Uh, I can't remember his name. No, that before him. Uh, he was there just a short time, and he threw the ugliest passes you ever saw. But somehow he was accurate with them, and he he was a pretty successful quarterback. But huh? Mostly because it makes it harder for the receiver, the guy to catch. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. And 
if you, especially if you're trying to get, get it to go down, you don't want it scooting you know, any further than it has to. Okay. I uh, don't see anything else here. Now, there are a couple of, uh, of other illustrations here. At the top of page 39, they talk about free fall again, and we've already named it, and do so that's well worth a read when you get your book. There's another figure here, it's sort of a dorky looking figure, but if you, what it is, is a kid sitting on the tree limb, way, way, way up there. Okay, how it got there, I don't know. But anyway, sitting on the tree limb, and you're on the ground throwing the ball up, okay? Now, if that kid was good enough, and, or you were good enough that you threw it just till it got to his height, and then the kid released his ball at the same time, they're going to fall at the same rate. Same type of principle you had with the arrow, only this is vertical. Or, you, uh, if you threw it higher than the kid on the limb, if you waited till it was right even with them and dropped it, they're going to fall at the same, well, let's see. No, that wouldn't quite be true. Because, you know, uh, uh, miss that one. If he, if he waited till it came back down and dropped it exactly then. If he's dropping it, he's releasing it zero. This doesn't have a vertical zero. It has something greater than zero. So that wouldn't work. It would only be if you could get it to stop right at that limb. It would be the same. And what I was going to say before when I got off on the snipers, uh, yeah, you always aim a little high, but if you had it set up, and this would be very difficult to do, that the moment you pulled the trigger, the thing was released from somewhere. Then you aim right at it. Because the moment you pull the trigger and it's released, the, it's going to fall at the same rate the bullet does. That's bizarre, but it would be true. You would aim straight at it. Of course, who could set up that kind of a precise system? I don't know. It had the same rate that the bullet would. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, okay, well, as long as it was a lot of paper, okay, if it was heavy, but, you know, remember I said about the 1,000 gram mass and the 1 gram mass, they fell at the same rate, you know, very different, as long as the shapes were fairly close to the same. All right. Something about equivalent to that, okay. All right. He's a skeptic, I can tell. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's look at the three laws of motion. We've gone out of the describing motion. Now we're going to look at defining motion. Why do things move the way they do? Now, the first law of motion was actually predicated by Galileo. He basically had done the first part. But Newton took what Galileo did, refined it somewhat, detailed it some, and added two more parts to it. So the three laws of motion, they're attributed to Newton, even though, now Newton was not known to be a very modest character, okay? He was a bit on the arrogant side. He was not an easy person to get along with. He had a reputation of being pretty, what would be a good word for it? Uh, Kind of that, but he also just didn't get along with people well. Now, they said it probably was from his, you know, the psychoanalyst had gotten involved with it. He was a, uh, huh? <laughs> Maybe not that bad. Okay. <laughs> the, uh, his dad died before he was born. You know, his, uh, I think about three months before he was born. So he started off growing up without a father, but he was a baby then. His mother remarried, and then when she started having kids by the second husband, she dumped Newton, sent him back to live with a grandmother. Well, Newton was born prematurely too, so it was thought he wasn't going to live at all. And then when 
the mother remarried, they sent him back to live with the grandmother, so he was didn't have a dad, was rejected by his mom, so he wasn't didn't have a lot going for him to begin with, except he was brilliant, you know. Uh, I think it was an uncle that recognized his skills and finally talked her into sending him to school. She was wanting to make a farmer out of him, and he was a terrible farmer because he didn't have any interest in it. He had interest in thinking of things. So. Anyway, so he came up with these laws of motion. It seems like to me I heard or read somewhere, basically a friend of his, you know, he had friends, uh, a guy named uh, Kepler, uh, had come up with these laws that governed the motion of the planets, but they were all empirical. He just did lots of measurements and said, yeah, this is how they do. He had no earthly idea why they thought that they followed these things. So he took it to Newton and said, can you come up with a reason that should follow these pretty complicated uh, equations? So Newton started studying it, and he found that the current state of mathematics at that time wasn't good enough to come up with those answers, but if he could control mathematics down to instantaneous speeds and acceleration and stuff, so he developed a whole new branch of mathematics called the calculus. That kind of stuff, okay. He had to come up with this so he could describe the three laws of motion. Well, but you know, he, he hated being wrong. So it took him decades of working on this. He did not want to publish it and have it out there for someone else. To, ah, you got that wrong, you know. He wanted it to be perfect. So he was sort of a perfectionist. He had shared it with another pretty brilliant mathematician over in Germany named Leibniz, okay? And he had run it by him to see what he thought, you know. He did it with other people too. Leibniz probably had been thinking some things along that line too, sort of from a different perspective, and I think, well, this is the big argument. Newton felt like he stole his work and then rushed and published it before Newton did. So the Germans believed that Leibniz developed calculus, and of course the British said, no, Isaac Newton did. And Newton could show that he had been working on it years before Leibniz had, but Leibniz published it first, so it was, they spent almost the rest of their lives feuding with each other over who did it first, so anyway. I was in Germany just so far ahead of everybody else. What's that? I was in Germany just so far ahead of everybody else as far as rockets. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, they're, they're a pretty smart people, that's for sure. Because we would have never made the place without. Yeah. Bert, Bob Braun and yeah, 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 Oppenheimer and several of those, yeah. Uh, but they had been working on it more, and uh, yeah, it, they're, they're they're very bright. Okay, <laughs> that's true too. And it wouldn't have been able to fool the EPA. No, I don't say that. Okay, so he developed calculus. And in the same process, came up with the law of gravitation, he came up with optics, he came up with, he just opened a bunch of fields that nobody else had. But the essential thing that he and Galileo did was come up with the idea of forces. This is the driving force. This is the thing that makes things happen. And these three laws of motion deal with that. So here's the first law. This is often called the law of inertia. And we talked about inertia earlier, remember? Okay, law of inertia, and this was largely formulated, or at least got started by Galileo. Okay, Newton refined it some. Here is one way of saying it. There's many ways of saying it, but this is one way. Every object retains its state of rest or its state of uniform straight line motion, whichever it happens to be in unless it's acted on by an unbalanced force. Unless it's acted on by an unbalanced force. And we talked about this before too, okay? Now, we also defined inertia earlier, and here we have it again. Inertia is that characteristic of an object that resists any changes in its motion, okay? Um, 
It wants to stay not moving. If it is moving, it doesn't want to change its motion. That's what inertia is. Okay? And inertia is largely, strongly correlated to the mass of the object. The bigger the mass, the more it resists changes. Okay? Either the move or change its motion. Okay? Uh, does it take much to make a ping pong ball waver? Blow on it and that's going to change it. Bowling balls, once you throw it, its path pretty much determined, right? Now, you can have spin and other things in it too, but anyway. So that's what the law of inertia is. Any object retains its state of rest or state of motion, uniform straight line motion, unless it's acted on by an unbalanced force. Okay. You've probably experienced this before. Any of you ever ridden in a bus that you had to stand and hold on to the rail? No, you haven't, okay. Uh, if you had, okay, you know that when that bus jerks forward, you say you're thrown back. What throws you back? Nothing throws you back. It's that the bus is moving out from under you. Your inertia is trying to keep you right where it is. The bus moves forward, and you feel like you're thrown back, okay? Or slam on brakes, and you're thrown forward. No, you're not. You just keep trying to keep your state of motion while the vehicle underneath you is stopping. And you've probably experienced this in a car before. Someone jerks the wheel one way or the other, and you say you're thrown against the door, thrown here and there. No, you're not. You're just trying to maintain your state of motion. And basically, when the car cuts in front of you, is, is really what happens. You feel like you're being thrown outward, but you're not. The car cuts in front of you, basically. The bus initially at rest, when it takes off, the force is this way. The person tends to stay where he is and moves backwards. At least in airport shuttles, you've been on those, have you, that you maybe you had to stand, whatever. Okay. What's that? Yeah, that is exactly why we wear seatbelts. Mm -hmm. uh, hit a tree, and you're going through the windshield. In fact, uh, I can remember when I was young, just back before there were seatbelts, on any car whatsoever, No, not when I was youngest, okay, and remember, yeah, and I was born in 51, they didn't have them back then, okay, the, uh, but I, uh, not only, and we'll talk about this in later chat, I, I don't want to rob that, we'll, we'll talk about that later, it has to do with the same type thing, but here's the bus going in straight line motion, you're flowing with it, yeah, everything's fine, suddenly the bus turns, and you're thrown, you feel like you're thrown outward. You're not. The putz actually cuts and pushes into you, but you feel like you're thrown outward. We call that sense of being thrown outward. People call it centrifugal force, but it's really not a force. It's centripetal force. The bus is pushing you to the center. That's center-seeking force. That's really what's happening. Okay? Uh, the force is needed to overcome inertia and change your direction, so it pushes you inward. And that's exactly why the banks at the curves and, and racetracks. Talladega, that's a huge bank, isn't it? It's about 37 degrees or something like that? 40, okay, it could be. I mean, it's, it's up there. It's one of the steepest, I think. Yeah, and I mean, the reason is something has to push the cars toward the center of the track yeah. at the speeds they're doing, and it's the, the, they use the bank to push that in. Okay. Otherwise, deep trouble. Okay. Now, the second law of Newton, motion, Newton's second, second law of motion. This is, uh, not, has, the first we call the law of inertia because that's what you're dealing with largely there. The second one, I always think of it in terms of a formula, and we'll get to the formula in a minute. 
but forces cause accelerations. And what are accelerations? Quick and dirty definition of acceleration. Change of velocity, exactly. To change something's velocity, you have to have a force doing it. To accelerate something, you have to have a force to do that. Now, the unit for these forces are newtons, okay? Named after Sir Isaac. And since it was named after a person, it's capitalized, okay? Now, this is the formula. They have a, well, let's see, they may show it here. Here it is, okay. Now, they put this little thing net under here. The net force acting on an object, if there's a net force acting on an object, it's going to change its uh, acceleration. So the force is proportional to the acceleration, the acceleration is proportional to the force. To change it from a proportionality to an e equality, an equation, the constant of proportionality is the mass of the object. There's that inertia again. Okay? So, the net force. Now, what do we mean by net force? Remember, forces are what kind of measurement? There's two types of measurements. Say again? One is talking about magnitude only, and the other is talking about magnitude with a... Remember the pine trees? The... Um, or some other dumb examples I gave. Um, what is a force with, <laughs> what is a quantity, do you call it, when it doesn't just have a magnitude, it also has a direction? Vector. A vector, exactly, okay. Force is a vector quantity. Acceleration is a vector quantity. Mass, though, is a scalar quantity. That's your constant of proportionality, okay? So, the second part of this is the force is always, the net force is always in the direction of your acceleration, or said the other way, your acceleration is always in the direction of your net force. So what do we mean by net forces? Remember the tugboat pushing on the ships? Remember that illustration from here? And then my pulling on the pine tree. Say again? Okay, yes, the, the vector sum of all the forces. You add them together, but you add them together as vectors. Now, here is a sort of... Positive and negative force. You, yeah, they could be positive and negative. They could be east, west, north, south, up, down, you know, anything such as that. Uh, the directions of the forces. Now, this is talking about net force right now. Here we have an airplane flying it. 500 miles an hour, okay, 500 miles an hour, straight line level flight, okay, this is real slow for 500 miles per hour, okay, but flying there, what's the net force acting on that airplane? All kinds of forces acting on it, what's the net force acting on the airplane? Say again? Gravity is certainly acting on the airplane. You got crosswind, but he's flying 500 miles per hour, level flight, 500 miles per hour. What's the net force acting on the airplane? Okay, let me ask you another question. Is that airplane accelerating? Yes. Is it flying 500 miles per hour? Yes. Constantly 500 miles per hour. But is it accelerating? If it's constant, it's not accelerating. So the net force on that airplane is zero. You're right. There's tons of forces acting on that airplane. Huh? Yeah. That, it was a trick question. Okay. All right. There are lots of forces acting on the airplane. You're absolutely right. Gravity is pulling that airplane down. What's keeping it up? Good question, huh? Did I show you this before? Shape of the wind is keeping it up. The what? Shape of the wind. Shape of the wind is pretty close to right. Okay. What is going to happen? Have I shown you this one before? 
I'll say so, okay. What happens if it was underneath the plate? You're absolutely right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, what happens if I blow it over the top of the thing? Uh oh. Mm. Why did that happen? Okay. <laughs> was my breath that bad? Okay. Is that what you said? Okay. Now, uh, of course, what happens when I blow it under it? The air molecules on the blow the forces the wind pushes on that and picks it up. Okay? But what happens when I blow over the top, what lifts it then is a principle. Remember when we talked about laws and principles and things like this? That's when I thought I may have mentioned it. It's called Bernoulli's principle. Okay? And y'all all used it before whether you know it or not. Okay? And it has to do with the shape of the wing. Because the shape of an airplane wing is basically something like that, right? Yeah. If you look at the cross section of it. So two things are happening then. As that plane is moving, then there is some air hitting here that tends to lift a little bit. So that's not most of it. The most of it is the fact that the air going over the top of the plane, and this is what's happening when I blow over the top here, Bernoulli's principle says, the velocity of a fluid, whether it's a gas or a liquid, okay, as the velocity increases, the pressure decreases. So when you, when you go, the air here has a split. Some of it moves down here, that pushes up, but some of it goes over the top, not just airplane wings, birds' wings are like this too. That's what the Wright brothers did. They modeled the wings of the aircraft after bird wings because they saw that tapered like that. The air that's here hits here, that goes up has to travel further. So therefore it has a longer distance, you know, to travel. This has a pretty short distance, that has a long distance but it have, travels it in the same time period, so therefore the speed increases. As the speed increases, the pressure decreases, so that provides the width. Yeah, that's what the foils are to keep your, you know, the, the, the back of the car down. Yeah, they, they basically do the reverse of that to try to push down on that, right? And at one time, Passenger cars had those on them. You shouldn't have been driving fast enough that that would have had any effect. So they were just there for show. But anyway, so that's exactly what's happening with an airplane wing. So that's what's providing the lift. Notice that airplane takes off down the runway. Why does it take such a long runway for it to take off? Because he has to build up enough speed to provide enough lift, so the air going over here is going fast enough to have enough lift to get them off the ground. How in the world do they do it on an aircraft carrier? They're not that long. Yes, they have a catapult that throws the aircraft off the deck at a really high rate of speed, and they have the engines, the afterburners and everything else, but even then, when they leave the deck, they dip. Hopefully not deep enough to get to the water and then take them off as they pick up more speed. You know, they land with the plane with that short hull and it's coming in right as you do. The tapers don't catch. And what? The tapers, the push don't grab them. Oh, oh, yeah, you mean on an aircraft carrier. Okay, I thought you meant on an aircraft carrier. Yeah, they... If you shut the engine down and you come out land and the plane don't catch you, you just fall. Yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. They got to be ready to yeah, if that doesn't catch, but yeah. Were you in the Navy? No. Oh, okay. Yeah. Discovery Channel. Discovery Channel, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay, so that's beginning to be the second law of motion. So let's look at this formula. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. What were the units for mass? We've talked about them, haven't we? SI system, unit for mass. 
Okay, gram is a unit for mass in the metric system, and it is in the other, but the SI system, they use the bigger unit, which is the, has gram in the name, kilogram, kilograms. On the street, they call them kilos, but we won't go there. Okay, now, no, you don't know about that, do you? Okay. Huh? Was I on the street? Oh. <laughs> yeah. I've lived a long time. Okay, let's put it that way. Okay, what's your basic unit for acceleration in the SI system? Did it in lab? Except you didn't use the SI. Okay, but SI units. Huh? No, that's that's U.S. customary, and that's speed. Meters. Nah, that's speed. Acceleration is. And you're the one hyping, huh? Per second squared, you got it. A kilogram meter per second squared, that's what a Newton is. We talk about forces as being Newtons, capitalized because it's named after uh, Sir Isaac, but Graham wasn't named after anybody, meters weren't named after anyone, seconds weren't named after anyone, those are lowercase, but a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. Okay? All right. And the proportionality concept there. So the greater the force, that means you have a greater acceleration. Or the greater acceleration, that means you have a greater force. Okay? Um, so I guess I sort of left you hanging with the aircraft there, literally. Okay? When you're flying along there at level speed, at level flight, constant speed, not turning one way or another. Constant speed 500 miles per hour, the net force is zero because you are not accelerating. Okay? Now, sure, gravity is pulling downward, well, it's pulling upward is a lift or new lease. Well, but, okay? What's, if you're encountering air resistance like crazy, if you're going at 500 miles per hour, that's why the engines are still, you know, still firing. You gotta have them firing to overcome that. You're not accelerating though. You've got a force thrust ahead by the engine, air resistance here, uh, gravity down, lift up, all these forces, but if you're traveling at a constant speed, your net force is zero, okay? And level flight, okay, net force is zero. Now, on the other hand, so more force, more acceleration, but if you increase the mass at the same acceleration, you have to increase the mass, the force, to keep that same acceleration. Or, if you have more mass at the same force, your acceleration is going to go down. Okay? Or, less mass at the same force, your acceleration goes up. So, I can... Okay, yeah, uh, that's, yeah, you, you're creating, yeah, more resistive force you know, in the opposite direction, and that slows you down. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So there is Newton's second law. Whereas the first law, we say the law of inertia, and just leave it like that. Second law, F equal MA. I mean, net force equals ma mass times acceleration. Now, hang on to this form here. We're going to see it again, but we're not going to be talking about net forces, but we will see it again. Okay? Here's some examples of Newton's second law. Again, more mass, more accelerator. And I think they have these slides sort of messed up. All right, here's one. Here's a guy tooling around on his bicycle. He's exerting the force by his pedaling uh, in this direction. But, say again. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's real fancy, okay? But he's not real serious because he's sitting up like this. If he was serious, he's going to be like that. Why? Aerodynamics. Aerodynamics. He wants to minimize his air resistance. You're absolutely right. And then he'd probably have one of those fancy helmets that looks like a, I don't know. Okay. 
but he's applying a force in this direction, but there's always friction with the tire and road. That's why he's able to pedal, by the way. Uh, and there's uh, some air resistance too. Now, as long as he's going along at a constant speed, that means even though he's applying the force this way, there's resistive force here and there. These are unbalanced forces, uh, but if, if those exactly add to this one, he's zero net force. Second, until you try to go up the hill, okay? Because then you also have gravity pulling down, so you have to pedal harder to overcome that one, okay? Now, zero net force. Does that mean he stopped? Why not? Okay, he's not accelerating, he's zero acceleration, but he does have, could have, a velocity. It's just not changing, okay? The airplane flying along, he had a speed, 500 miles per hour. That's going pretty fast, but if it wasn't changing speed, his net force was zero, his acceleration was zero. So as long as the forces are balanced, then the net force is zero, the acceleration is zero. Okay, now, now this, the slides aren't set up well here. Okay, I don't think it's going to show up at all. Nah. It was supposed to be in here, but it shows in your book. Okay. I think it shows in your book. Okay, uh, wait, I forgot. Yes, exactly. Hold on just a second. I missed a, a figure here. A moving airplane, when you feel forces in many directions, when the plane changes its motion, you cannot help but notice that the forces involved, there is a change in motion. So guess what? What gives us the thrills and the sense of moving is not the speed you're going. It's the acceleration you're going. If you're going at a constant speed, not a lot of thrill there at all. In fact, unless you have vibrations or can look at something, you can hardly tell you're moving. It's only an acceleration. What is it that's fun about roller coasters? Nothing. Adrenaline. Huh? Adrenaline. Yeah, okay. And the reason is you're accelerating almost constantly there. Either increasing speed, decreasing, change in direction. Those are all accelerations, okay? Many of them puke-inducing acceleration, but yeah, we won't go there. Okay, there is a first law experiment, uh, and I meant to say this one back when we were doing it. Uh, I don't have a pickup anymore, but I had one for several years, many years, and one time I was taking my lawnmower to get it serviced because it was leaking fuel and I didn't have the tools or the probably even the skills really to be able to repair that so I took it to get it repaired and thought I had it chocked pretty well in the back of the pickup uh -huh. but not okay no it didn't start a fire but every time I turned boom boom you know because it's inertia tried to keep it from turning or sped up or slowed down scoot scoot you know one way or another and I've been in the back of a pickup when my brother was driving, and it was the same time of experience. I mean, not, no, I'm just kidding. Kind of. Okay. So anyway, you have those. And by the way, on Bernoulli's, have you ever had, say, a piece of plywood in the back of your pickup that you didn't secure, and you start batting down the highway, and then you happen to notice it's lifting out of your bed. What is causing that? Okay, the lift, the newly for A lot of people say, oh, the wind's getting under it and picking it up. That's not really, huh? The speed of the air across the top is greater than the, the air underneath it, and your pressure, in, pressure differential, there it lifts up. So you better tie things down. But in your book, and this is where the, the slides messed up, if he's going along here, fine, but say he's on a bicycle built for two, but doesn't have any second on there, then fine. Force, net force, blah, blah. But what if, 
Notice the gal, if you don't, only one of you has a book. The gal is sitting behind them on the second seat. And let's just say, she doesn't want to say this, but if she's the same mass he is, probably not, but you know, let's just say that. Uh, but she, <laughs> notice her feet, they're not on the pedals. So she's not contributing to the force what has happened to the acceleration. If he's exerting the same force, it's reduced because it doubled the mass without changing the force, so the acceleration decreased. Like a paddle boat, you said? Yeah, I've been there, done that, yeah. Right. You'll know it. You absolutely will, okay. You've taken my wife out on the paddle boat? Too? No, I didn't say that. Okay. All right. So, this basically Newton's second law of motion. The acceleration of object is directly proportional to the net force acting on it, inversely proportional to the mass of the object. That's what it gets down to, those proportionalities. Now, what we're going to do now, I need to get a, yeah, here's one. Let's do example 2.8. A 60 kilogram bicycle, what's that a measure of? Mass, you're absolutely right. That's the mass of the bicycle. It's bicycle and rider, by the way. 60 kilogram bicycle. You don't want any bicycles that are 60 kilograms. <laughs> Way too massive. Okay. Accelerate and rider. Accelerate at, so the acceleration is 0 0.5 meters per second squared. They're accelerating. How much extra force was applied to take that from a zero acceleration to 0.5 meters per second squared. How much force? So you're looking for net force. And what is your net force? Remember that formula. Okay, mass times acceleration. For net force is mass times acceleration. So that was 60 kilograms times 0.5 meters per second squared, and that would be what? Pretty easy. 30, 30 what? Kilogram meter per second squared. And what's another unit for that? 30 newtons, absolutely. All right, and that's what they got. Example 2.9. So let's erase these. I don't think we'll need that anymore. Okay, what is the acceleration? This time we're looking for acceleration. Yes, you certainly can. How would you do your triangle there? Okay, net force on the top, mass and acceleration on the bottom. You got it. Okay, so what is the acceleration? This time we're looking for that one of a 20 kilogram cart. What's a 20 kilogram cart? What does that measure? That's the mass of the cart. Uh, if the net force on it is 40 newtons. So 40 newtons is the net force. Okay. So we're looking for the acceleration. How do we do that? One? Okay. Now, when you divide this, I like to break newtons down to its fundamental units. What are the fundamental units for newtons? Kilogram, meter per second squared. Okay, mass times acceleration. Divide that by 20 kilograms. Kilograms go out, 20 will go into 40 how many times? Two meters per second squared. That's a good unit for acceleration. Yes, I think we have it. Now, <laughs> um, it better not accelerate too long at that rate because that's really increasing in force very, very rapidly. Okay, they also have a concept supplied a second uh, law experiment and uh, you may, yeah, I will. 
We'll do some of these, not in today's lab, but in Tuesday's lab. We will do some second law experiments in that. Okay? In fact, one of the experiments we'll do Tuesday will involve not just second law, but we'll compare it with first law as well. Okay? So, let's move on to weight and mass. I said hang on to the concept of the force equation. Now, mass is a quantitative measure of your inertia. I don't know if you tied the two together. I think I've said it several times, but they really are related to each other. Inertia is sort of a concept. Mass is the quantifying that inertia. Okay? It has to do with the amount of matter that's there. Okay? Now, um, dumb example. I sure wouldn't want to catch Nolan Ryan's fastball back when he was pitching. Thank whoever, Randy Johnson, whoever the fireball pitchers are now. Uh, I wouldn't want to catch them anyway. But if you can imagine them throwing a bowling ball that fast, I'm not even going to get back there, okay? Why? Because the mass of the bowling ball is inertia is so much more. And if it was going that fast, basically you've got a cannonball, okay? No, you don't want to be messing with that. What's that? Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. Now, mass is a quantitative measure of inertia. The amount of matter there is. What weight is, though, is a force. It's not a mass. It's related to a mass, but it's not the same. Even though the scales in the grocery store have on the outer part how many pounds you have, you're buying on the inner part how many kilograms wrong, okay? If you're measuring pounds, you should be measuring newtons, not kilograms. Everybody's used to measuring mass in kilograms, but then forces in pounds. Uh, no one has a drink bottle with them today. Let's see if this has anything on it. Okay? No, nope, this is all volume. That's not mass. If you had something, anyone have a candy bar or anything? Okay. Whatever you'll see, quite often there'll be so many ounces or pounds, and then in parentheses, kilograms. Raw. Those are not, those are measuring different things. Okay? Now, I'll tell you how you can get away with it later, but right now. So weight is the force of gravity acting on the mass. So the mass is involved with weight, but it's not the only thing there. So pounds and newtons measure force. Kilograms measures mass. What was the U.S. customary unit for measuring mass? Huh? No, nope, that's also a metric. No, that's ma that's a force. Didn't I tell you this one before? We never use it. Slug, yeah, this is a slug. We never use, in the U.S. customary, we don't talk about mass. We just don't do it. We talk about weight. We don't talk about mass. That's why to counter a kilogram, we don't use anything. If you put in the grocery store how many slugs is this, I don't want any of it, you know. It just doesn't work. So kilogram is a measure. Say again. Yeah, right. Okay. But here's how <laughs> Yeah, like three slugs of potato please. Okay. Uh, Force is mass times acceleration. Now, when you see that, you understand that's net force. Because the only thing that will cause an acceleration is a net force. The only thing that will, uh, the net force will change your acceleration. But the formulas are very equal because weight, and little w usually represents weight, that's the parameter for weight, little w, lowercase w, is mass times zero. What acceleration? The acceleration due to gravity, that thing that's pulling you down. Okay? So that's where these two formulas are similar. This is a net force, that's an actual acceleration of the object. This is the weight, whether the object's moving or not, the weight is its mass 
times the acceleration due to gravity. That doesn't mean you're accelerating, it means the acceleration due to gravity. And that acceleration due to gravity, as we've already said, is 9.8 meters per second squared in the SI system. U.S. customary would be 32 feet per second squared. Okay, so this should help you remember the weight formula. Weight is always mg. Always, because the only thing that gives something weight is its acceleration due to gravity. All right. Before we move to that, though, we have another couple of examples. Let's do them here. Okay. They actually have a little table in the book when they talk about masses in the English system. They don't use the word slug there either. What unit they use? Pound per foot, pound per foot per second. Pound per foot per second square. Yeah, a real easy one to say or even to measure. Yeah, they should be saying slug, but no one uses it, so they they use the other. One. All right. Here are a few of the convert conversion factors you'll often see, but these really aren't very fair, okay? I've already given you 32 feet per second square is about the same as 9.8 meters per second square. We've already talked about that one. Um, kilogram is measure of mass. That's the English unit of weight, one pound, is comparable to the metric unit of 4.5 newtons. Yeah, it's all right to compare those two. Let me go back to this slide, okay? Those are comparable, but what you see all the time is a conversion, they say, kilograms to uh, pounds. That one really isn't very fair. And thank goodness the book doesn't even do that. Okay, so let's go back and hit this one. Example 210. What is the weight, so we're looking for weight, little w, that's our unknown here, of a 60.0 kilogram person? What's that a measure of? That's your mass. On the surface of the earth. Oh. Let me go back up here too. Why can we do what we do, which is so bizarre, is comparing weights with masses, putting them on the same scale. Why can we do that? What does it differ by? A constant. Yeah, and it's a constant anywhere. Now if you're up in outer space, don't even try. Okay? It's not comparable because there is not at the exist. But anywhere on the surface of the earth, we can talk about it. All you're doing is scaling. It's sort of like G becomes your scaling factor, your constant proportionality. Even though they're talking about different measures completely, they're equivalent to each other. And that's why we can say um, a pound is equivalent to 2.2 kilograms. It's not. Pound measures weight, kilogram measures mass, but because of the constant due to acceleration, that's why we can sort of make those comparisons. Not fair to do, but you can do it. Okay. So, what is the weight of a 60 kilogram person? Can you give it to me? What's the formula? Weight, by the way, is a force. So what would be the formula? Weight is equal to mass times what acceleration? Gravity acceleration. There's a formula for weight always and ever. Okay. Now they didn't give you G, but you should know it. So you're looking for weight. Mass is 60.0 kilograms. And what is your acceleration due to gravity? 9.8 watt units, meters per second squared. So this will be 
60 times 9.8. That goes out, and you'll have 6 times that would be 48. 54, 58. 588 what? Newtons. Very good. Now, I bet you the book doesn't give that as an answer. And here's why. Well, yeah. Here's why. Even though you have three significant digits here, they yeah, only they count. Did, they, they did five, eight, oh, they did? Then they, yeah, and that's why. Because this only has two units of precision. So therefore, you can't have that. So they round this and say that's approximately 590 newtons. Yeah, they put the different units. That isn't what matters. Okay. I, I think I know what you're saying. Okay. They put this as kilogram meter per second squared. Is that what you were meaning? That is a newton. That doesn't change. They change this because you only have two digits of precision. So they took, they counted off two digits, looked to the right, it was greater than five, so you rounded this one off by one. So, in my mind, that's not much difference. I'm not going to be nitpicking with that. Yeah, except you don't have that kind of precision coming in, so how can you get it going out? That That's the point, okay? Now, yes, if, or 9.81, sometimes you'll see that written too. To two digits, it's 9.8. Yeah. Now, example 2.11. Same 60 kilogram person, okay? But he only weighs 100 newtons, so his weight is 100 newtons, 100.0 newtons on the moon. He's 590 or 588 newtons on earth. How can that happen? Because the 9.8 is only constant on the earth's surface. Any other planet, any other moon, any other asteroid, any anything that you're going to be on, it's going to generally have a different acceleration due to gravity. About one six, you're absolutely right. So, what is the acceleration due to gravity on the moon? Well, we use the same thing. This is acceleration of gravity on Earth. We use the same formula and do weight is equal to mass times, and this will be on the moon, and this is mass times uh, acceleration due to gravity on the moon, not that on the Earth. So this is what we're looking for this time. So what are we going to do? Well, you take your 100 pounds. Is that what you said? I mean 100 newtons. But a newton is a what unit? Fundamental unit? Kilogram. Meter per second squared. Divide that by your acceleration, uh, by your mass because that's what you're dividing by here. The mass is still 60 kilograms. Okay. Notice the kilograms go out. Zeros go out. And 10, divi 10 divided by 6 is 5 divided by 3, right? That would be 1 and 2 thirds. So that's approximately... Um, 1.67. Okay, I don't think we have enough precision to that, so we really should say 1.7 units meters per second squared, which is a good unit for an acceleration. Okay? About 1.7 on the Earth, 9.8 meters per second. Okay, take your uh, 9.8 and divide it by 6. Like you said, it's about 1.6. And you'll see you're you're pretty close to that. Okay. All right. Say this again. Okay. That's if you take the nine point eight and divide by six. 
But you remember we said it's approximately one six. It's not exact. So, yeah. So you got it. You, your guess was right. It was pretty good. All right. I don't remember we went through all this slide, even though we've written on it several times here. More mass is less acceleration. Again, the focus is on net force. The net force is zero. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. That was the bicycle. I think we did that. Okay. All right. Let's do. Let's go up here. We've just done that. We will pause here and do... All right, not quite here yet. Here it comes. Okay, um, we've covered the first two laws. Basically, they tie together pretty nicely. First law, the law of inertia, that an object, any object, is going to maintain its state of motion, in other words, at rest, or uniform straight line motion constant velocity unless it's acted on by an unbalanced force. If it's not acted on, it's going to keep moving. Okay. Unbalanced forces could be friction, air resistance, even gravity, something like that. Okay. Second of all, if it is acted on by an unbalanced force, that force is going to cause an acceleration. Positive acceleration, negative acceleration, change of direction acceleration, some type of acceleration. The third law is pretty different from the other two, and it, though it's pretty important as well. Newton's third law of motion states that, here's how it differs. In the other two laws, we focus on one object. That object maintains its state of motion, or no motion, unless acted on by an unbalanced force, or if acted on by unbalanced force and that force, then it accelerates. That one object accelerates. The third law of motion, though, it has to deal with two objects. What is the source of the force has to be other objects. So the third law relates forces between two objects. Now, I've heard it said, I don't know if this is true or not, that Newton said, if I push on a rock, the rock pushes on me, and you can tell the dash pushed on me because it indented my finger, okay? So basically it says whenever two objects interact, any two objects interacting, the force exerted on the one object is equal in size, but opposite in direction to the force exerted on the other object, okay? Equal and opposite forces. Now, does that mean equal and opposite velocities? No. Equal and opposite accelerations? No. Equal and opposite forces. Okay? And by the way, now that I said that, it reminded me. Um, when we were talking about mass and weight, we said they're related only on the surface of the Earth. Are they directly related to each other? Anywhere else or not? Okay? And we sort of hit this on that moon example we just did. If you go to the moon or to outer space, does your mass change? No, your mass is still your mass. Does your weight change? Yeah, you're in a different gravitational field, so by all means your weight would change. So what we say is that mass is a invariant a quantity that doesn't vary depending on where you are. Forces are variant, velocities are variant, uh, accelerations, yeah, all those things change, mass is not. Mass is an invariant. It doesn't change depending on the situation that you're in, okay? So, a good weight loss scheme would be go to outer space. You're going to lose weight, right? The trouble is, you're going, when you come back, you'll Unless you really lost weight, you're going to gain it all back when you're done. Okay. Never mind. Okay. What's that? Yes, exactly. Your mass is the same, but your weight changes because you're in a different gravitational field. It's not what they mean by that. 
And that's the only slide they had here on Newton's third law. In the text, they had a lot better stuff, okay? They show the astronaut pushing on a satellite. And I think they give you that the astronaut was half the mass of the satellite, okay? So when the astronaut pushes on the satellite, guess what? The satellite pushes on him. The forces are same, equal and opposite, but because the astronaut is lighter in mass, the satellite is more massive, the satellite moves a little, the astronaut moves a lot, okay? Forces are equal and opposite, but the velocities, their accelerations, those kinds of things. If the masses are different and the masses, you know, uh, then, then, yeah, you can't say that. Now, um, there were a couple, and I think what we'll do is stop after these. We won't get into momentum. So let's go back to our writing board here and do these couple of uh, examples under Newton's third law. Okay. I wish we had the picture. Let me see if I can find the picture. Ah, there it is. Here's the picture that we're going to be using. Okay. So, sort of get the picture in mind here. I'm going to go back and Do them in here. A 60 kilogram astronaut, 60.0 kilogram astronaut. What's the mass of? <laughs> what is that a measure of? Mass of the astronaut. Sorry about that. I blew that one, didn't I? Floating freely in space pushes on a freely floating 120 gram kilogram spacecraft. Okay, so what's that going to be? Huh? Now, what's this again? Yeah. Basically, yeah, right. Yeah. But relative to each other, you're not moving. Yeah, that, that's the, the concept here. Uh, this is the mass of the spacecraft, okay? He pushes on it, and the force with the push is a 30 Newton force. Okay, and this will be the force. Now, this is the force with which he pushes on the spacecraft. And I'm going to try to use the same kind of... Uh, thing that he used. Uh, force A due to B, so this would be spacecraft due to the astronaut. The force of the spacecraft by the astronaut. Okay? The A part here. It says compare the forces exerted on the astronaut and the spacecraft. He pushes on the spacecraft with 30 newtons force. With what force does the spacecraft push on him? Equal but opposite directions. Remember, forces are vector quantities. So if he's pushing this way on the spacecraft, the spacecraft is pushing that way on him, but it has to be the same. This will be the force of the astronaut on the astronauts by the spacecraft. Okay? So they're equal but opposite. So they're not the same. They're equal magnitude but opposite directions. B, compare the acceleration of the astronaut to the acceleration of the spacecraft. Okay, so what is acceleration? Or what's the relationship between forces, masses, and acceleration? Yeah, net force. Okay, we'll do the net force on the astronaut is 
the mass of the astronaut times the acceleration, which you're looking for, of the astronaut. Okay? So the net force, we said, was 30.0 newtons. Except I want to write that in fundamental units. What would that be? Newton is a fundamental units for Newton. We've done it before, recently. Kilogram. Say again. Meter per second squared. Okay? And that's equal to the mass of the astronaut, which was 60.0 kilograms times the acceleration of the astronaut. Okay? We don't know what that is. That's what we're looking for. So what will we do? Divide both sides by 60.0 kilograms. And what do you have? Everything goes out here. What's I got? One half or point five zero zero because we have three significant digits everywhere and your units, the kilograms go out meters per second squared. So that's the acceleration of the astronaut. Okay? Now, what we also need to do is the acceleration of the spacecraft. Now, I'm running out of room here, so let me just sort of set it up as I go. Acceleration of the spacecraft will be the force on the spacecraft divided by the mass on the spacecraft. That's what we did before. I just wanted to keep it in one equation here because I'm running out of room. And this will be the force on the spacecraft is still 30.0 kilogram meter per second divided by its mass, 120.0 kilograms. And what will that be? One-fourth or 0.750 and the kilograms go out, that's meters per second squared, by the way, meters per second squared. What's that? 0.25, I'm sorry. 0.25 kilogram, uh, meters per second squared. Okay, 0 0.250. All right, now, example 2.13, I know we're probably out of time, right? Yeah, okay, let's get this one in. Uh, after the interaction and acceleration between the astronaut and the spacecraft described, they both move away from their original positions. What is the new speed for each? Okay. They both started from rest, so at zero. Here's the acceleration of the astronaut. There's the acceleration of the spacecraft. Okay. Uh, so, now, they didn't give us any, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't finish reading the problem. Sorry, I knew there had to be. They say he pushes on it for 1.50 seconds, and that's a time. And we didn't use time in the A or the B part, but we will use it in... 2.13. Okay? So, yuck, I don't have much room. So I'll write it here. The V final for the astronaut is what? How does it relate to acceleration in time? Okay, and what is that formula? V final minus V initial over, yeah, over your time. But if initial velocity is zero, right? They started from rest, so this will be 
V final. T, okay? If it's a difference, change of velocity over change of time, that's one acceleration. If you're doing average acceleration, you'd add the two initial, no, you'd add initial acceleration, final acceleration. We don't have that. That's a different issue. This is acceleration is change of velocity over change of time, and this would be V final is equal to AT. Okay? Multiply both sides of the equation by T. Go out there. Okay? So V final for the astronaut would be his acceleration, 0 0.500 meters per second squared, multiplied by that time interval, 1.50 seconds, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay, and notice one of the seconds goes out in the per second squared. All of it goes out here. So the V final would be 1.5 times 0.5. That's 0 0.750 meters per second, right? Okay, V final for the spacecraft would be its acceleration which is 0 0.250 meters per second squared times that 1.50 seconds. One second goes out here and here, and that gives you exactly half that, 0 0.375 meters per second. Okay. So the astronaut is moving away much faster than the spacecraft. Now here's sort of a dumb question. If he had done that, are they ever going to be able to get back together? Nope. They just keep on trucking because there's no air resistance, nothing you can push on to get him back. So what he hoped, he was tied to it so he can pull himself back if he wants to get back. Okay, if he had on a rocket backpack, like Toy Story, who is that? Buzz Lightyear, yeah, right, okay. If he had that, yeah, he could get back to it. But, you know, most of the time they don't have that, so yeah. Okay, or maybe, I don't know. All right, and so you see he is moving much faster, in fact, twice as fast as the spacecraft. All right, we'll end there and pick up next time with momentum, okay? And we are moving along pretty well. I think the next time we'll probably finish the chapter. I don't know for sure. But we'll at least get far enough to have one more lab. And then we will have, if we don't finish the chapter, we'll the, the following time. Uh, I hope, did anyone go down and check at the bookstore over the, when you had your break? Still not there? He is aggravating the fool out of me. Okay, but anyway, we'll get this. So let me pop. All right, we've got the basic setups here. Here's what we're going to do. Hopefully you've read this and are, you know, know what approximately we're going to do. So uh, there's a bunch of equations. We'll come back to those in a minute. If you'll turn to page 67 on the procedure, okay? Now what you're going to do here uh, and I want to go through and check one more time and make sure we have everything like I want it. So I'll need to be able to get. Yeah. Okay. This is going to have to come to there. So can you pull that? Yeah. Okay. Oh, we're going to roll on. Okay. No. We're just using this to measure right now. Okay. Yours is set up well, so don't lose anything. Let's see about yours. That right, looking pretty good. And yours, yes. Okay, that's good enough. And yours, uh, looking pretty good too, y'all. So well. All right. Now, this is going to be hard to record this because I'm moving all over the lab. Yeah, you I was going to do that. Okay. Now, one thing differently from what it says in the instructions here. It says adjust the ramp. I don't want you adjusting the ramp at all, okay? Here's what we're going to do. Get your meter stick. See, right 
why I set it up this way, I wanted you to know how far you were from the end of that thing to the edge of the table. What is that? One meter. One meter, which is how many centimeters? A hundred centimeters. Very good. So now we want to move your meter stick. Okay? Now, what you're going to do with the meter stick is the first measurement you're going to make is you're going to release the ball from 10 centimeters up. So I'm going to get here. So the 10 centimeters, wherever you see that is, best guess is 10 centimeters. That's where you're going to go. Okay? So you're going to need, now you can use these for the 10 and the 20. No, it won't because this doesn't go right to the edge. You will need to use this one. Okay? So this will be for your 10 centimeters. Okay? Now, what you're going to do, everybody see what you're doing? Yeah. Okay, measure it. Where on the ramp your 10 centimeters is off the floor, off the tabletop. Okay, that's where you're going to start your ball. Okay? Now, you're going to have a timer, right? Each team has a stopwatch. Don't you? Yeah. You don't have a stopwatch? Here's your stopwatch. Okay? Remember on the stopwatches, Except for Charles's, okay. Start is at you know about one o'clock. Stop is at one o'clock. Reset is at ten or eleven o'clock. Okay, one to two. Okay, start, stop, reset. Okay, now, so one of you is going to release the ball. Okay, you're going to use your. Okay, okay. I would say now. Wait, wait. I would say let the other person do the stopwatch. One releases from the fixed height, and the other does do the thing. Because you're not measuring from the release time. What you're measuring from is when it hits the tabletop until when it leaves the tabletop. Okay? So that's the time that you're measuring. And you can hear that. Okay? Everybody understand? The time you're measuring is from hitting the tabletop to leaving the tabletop. You can move the trash can. You can move the trash can. Certainly can. Okay? Now, make at least three runs from the 10 centimeter height. Okay? Record the time, the data on your data table on page 70. 6.1, and you'll measure your times there. After you measure your times, you'll calculate your velocities. Then you'll average your velocities. Okay? So remember the time is only on the horizontal piece. Not when he releases the ball, when it hits the table, until it rolls off the table, the horizontal distance off. So y'all can start making those measurements now. Yeah, you're not throwing out high and low. You're actually doing an average this time. Okay, it seems like it's dangerous here. Maybe I should move. Okay. close to each other, okay, then you can start your calculations. So you get your calculators. Okay. Are you letting it get to the edge of the table or did you stop it? No. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So do your three times. Okay. Now do your calculations. You got to do these first. Okay, all three of your times get pretty close to each other? Okay, say those again. 
Okay, that's a close enough. Okay, now wait, before you go anything else, okay, have you calculated your velocities then? You, okay, you know how far it traveled. I'd say, and that was how many centimeters? 100 centimeters divided by the time will give you your velocity, right? Okay. Once you get those three velocities, then you get your average velocity, and that's v sub x. Now, what you do with your meter stick now, can I, uh, Next thing you're going to do is measure the height to the floor from the top edge of the table. I'll let you do the measurement for the top edge to the nearest tenth of a centimeter. Okay? Nearest tenth of a centimeter. The meter stick from floor to top. Okay? To the nearest tenth of a centimeter. Yeah. 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 yeah, this is 80, 90, so yeah. It'll be 90, 91, 92, and then whatever your temps are. Okay, whatever. All right. Now, we've got a pretty major calculation to make now. Okay? You've recorded the vertical distance. Now you've got to calculate how far you think it'll be from the edge of this table until it hits the floor. You're, you've got a vertical distance. You're going to estimate a horizontal distance before it hits the floor. Okay? Now, there's nowhere to write in here. So since all of you have made your measurements, let's go over to the other lab so I can use that board. Okay? And we're going to do yeah, yeah, your paper. That's all you need. And maybe your calculator. I didn't ask this. Did all of you get your average velocity? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Get those before you come up. Okay. 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 Well, we got to do that home before we did. Yeah. Yes. What's your unit say? Centimeters divided by time. Distance divided by time. Whoa. So we're supposed to have an average depth? Yeah. You okay. He's got, we've written all of these down. Okay, and then you so add the three together and divide by three. That's your average. Huh? Adam. Add the three and divide by add the those three and divide by three. Right. Okay. When you got an average come on the, across the hall. No, it was just breaking it. I don't know. I hit the ground fault interrupt button and it popped. And now it's not working. Nope. Okay, well, that one. Do not have a switch. Add model in five by three. Pop it right here. Should work. Oh, I didn't push hard enough. Pop it. Okay. Let's see if it's working. Yeah, got it.
Okay. And they were good to leave. Okay, we're we're good. All right. (laughs) Now, what you have so far, all of you got a delta y, all right? Yes. That's the distance from the floor to the tabletop. Have we got all? No, we're still missing a group, aren't we? Yes. Okay. Where are they? Okay. Every group has a delta y, right? Okay. What is the delta y measured in? What units? Huh? Centimeters. This is measured in centimeters. Okay? At some point you're going to need G. Okay? And we should know what that is. We're calculating delta X. That's our unknown. And you just calculated your visa back, didn't you? What unit is that in? Centimeters per second. Very good. Now what is G usually measured in? What what's the usual measurement for that? And what is it? What is it? No, 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 this is a gram. This is your acceleration due to gravity. It's what? What G equals your gravity? What uh, what yeah, what is the number for? Uh, 9.8 squared. What? Meters per second squared. What's wrong with this picture? We're missing some numbers. Okay, yeah, this is the one number we're missing. We're going to be calculating that. Yes, you got meters and centimeters. So how do you get this to centimeters per second squared? Just do 100 centimeters. 100 centimeters per meter, so that would be? 100 meters. Wouldn't be a lot. What would be, you have to move the decimal bar. Yes, how many places? Four. Four. One. Probably three times. Okay. Meters would be one centimeters. Two times. Two times, 100. So that would be? Well, he said two. Oh, okay, I can't hear. Okay. <laughs> 980 <laughs> centimeters per second squared. Okay, so you're going to need that. Okay? Here's the formula they give you. They say that delta Y, this is from the reading that you did, you did, okay, is equal to, you did, one half G times delta X squared divided by V sub X squared. Okay? What we're looking for is delta X. We have, you've measured this, we know this, and you calculated this, right? So you need to get this, you're looking for this one. So how do we do that? Okay. How about let's start with the 2. Multiply both sides of the equation by 2. Done, right? Okay. You have another denominator here, so let's multiply by that. V sub x squared. V sub x squared. That's out of it. And then, we need to divide by g. Okay, divide by g. That gives me delta x squared. Right? But I want delta x. So what we want to do is a square root. So let's write it down here. Delta x would then be the square root of 2 delta y v sub x squared divided by g. That's the calculation you do now. Why not? Okay. No. You won't have anything this time. Thank you. Okay. You're awesome. You're awesome. Okay. Wipe it off. Wipe it off. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Enough of that. Awesome.
seriousness aside now. Okay. All seriousness aside. All right. So we're not making any decisions. You've got the data. Have you done your calculation? You calculate, I mean, you measure, you that was a lot. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a lot. Okay. That's like 97 points for me. You calculated your V sub X, you just got the square. So multiply 2 times your delta Y times your V sub X squared, and then divide by G, and then take the third. Mm -hmm. Nine hundred eighty. We had to change it to centimeters per second squared, so it's nine hundred eighty centimeters per second squared. Otherwise, your number would be huge. Unless, while you're doing that, let's play around with the units a little bit. Okay. The delta y here, you know, is two has no units. That's just a two. Okay. Delta y is measured in centimeters. V sub x was made, measured in centimeters per second, but you squared that, so it's centimeters squared per second squared. You're dividing that by g, which is in centimeters per second squared. That's all under the square root. Well, this centimeter will cancel out one of those. This per second squared cancels out that per second squared. That leaves you the square root of a centimeter squared, which is a square root of centimeter squared is centimeter. And that's a good thing for delta x to be measured in. Yeah. Don't forget to take the square root of the unit. Uh, I don't know. How many digits did you have here? Probably three? Yeah. Okay, this we had either two or three. How about your V sub X? What do you have for that? Your graph has a four. Second? Okay, so how many digits is that? Three. Okay, so I'd say around the three. That's a good thing for X to be measured. Anyone else get an X yet?
Yes, sir. That sounds reasonable. What units? Centimeters. Centimeters. Yep. No, no. It's all centimeters square. That's just the way it was delineated. So you got the middle square, though. Yeah, yeah. Two more heights. Is that five? Two more centimeters. Yeah, that's the and square root of center. Okay, now wait, wait. Okay. The point divided by the root. Yeah, okay, no, no. Well, yeah. You wrote it wrong. It sounded like you said it right. Yeah. 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 That should be the root. Uh, yeah. Divided first. Yeah. 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 Okay. 
Got your measure all but one's one team. Uh but they need to go, so let's head on. Can I erase this now? Yeah, I got mine written down. Does your phone have one? When you get an answer, bring it on over to me. Sorry, we just needed the board here, but we're working over the... Okay. Okay. Now, y'all estimated, all three of your groups, the fourth one's coming, estimated your delta x. Okay. So that's basically how far we need to put our cup. Yes, you got it. So from the edge of the table is right together. So I know they're working. Okay. If you don't have a calculator, someone will have a calculator so they can do it. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Down here, 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 here. Well, we got the mark, this mark, and we're going to use this. I'll start and start. Yeah, but you just put your cup down here, and then you can get this back. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, 
You want that to be the center of the cup, don't you? What's that? Yeah, I would say so. And then, boy, is that where you're going to hit the floor? That's going to hit the floor, so you'll have to do a little bit of a cut. So this is supposed to be delta eight? That's what you calculated, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, 
Okay, all the teams are working on the 20 and the 30 centimeter drops, and we'll move on from there. I'm going to pause now for a moment. All right, the question here is doing the, the, uh, the graph. And where you're going to be looking for this under procedure is... Uh, so it shows how to do it in here. Say again? So it shows how to do it in here. It doesn't show you, but it, it, it says what it is. Number one, on page 68 for the graph. Make a graph with velocity on the horizontal axis and distance on the vertical axis. Okay. So I want your range of velocities between the three heights there. You had a, what, 40-something? And then what? Look at your data. 40, 60, or 40, 70, something? Yeah, we've had a 45, 76.4, and 86.6. Okay. Those were your data. Now let's do your... Um, Say again now. Okay. I'm, I'm reading off page 68. Make a graph with velocity on the horizontal axis. And was what you're just giving me your velocities or was that your distance? That was my distance. That's our uh, distance up again. Yeah. Where our, okay, where that, our would land. Okay. So what was high and low of that? 40 something to 80. 80. Okay. How about your, your uh, velocities? Uh, velocities is like 186. Uh, the average was, yeah, the lowest was uh, 105, and the highest was 188. 188. 188. So it sounds like a bigger range there than you had for your, yeah, if, if I'm hearing right. Okay, so therefore your horizontal needs to be the longer axis, and your, whoa, vertical needs to be the vertical, the, your, your, the, uh, the Y needs to be the shorter axis here. Okay. Um, this time I'm going to write them down because I can't hold them in my head. What is the range of your delta axis? Low to high. Okay, low them is 105.6. And then your high was 188.6. Okay. And this was 45 to what? To 81. 81. Okay. Now, I don't think we need a zero on here, so let's see what we got. If we said 100. We go by 20s here, by 2, 4, 6, 8, 20s. Yeah. And then go by. Yeah. If you did 100. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. That would do great. Okay? So just start at 100. Don't start at 0. Start at 100. And then going up, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. Okay? Okay. And then you did... Does that work? It, it would, but you're scrunching things down more than you need. You could start here at, say, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. You get it all on that way. Because you don't need the zeros. You just need to cover all your data. All right. 
Got it. Yeah. That should do it for yours. Now, I uh, can't say every group will be that way, but that should do it for yours. Boy, we lost everybody. I did. No, I mean, we got one group completely and two thirds of one and half of another. If you've done all the measurements and like to do the calculations back in the classroom where it might be a little more comfortable than these stools, you can, or you can stay here. It doesn't matter to me. Thank you. 